All right. All at the same time. Unblank your screen. <laughs> Amy just showed up. Blank your screen. <laughs> and then, and now has to unblank your screen. <laughs> Yay. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of Universe Today. And this is for... Uh-oh. How many headphones? How many headphones? Well, hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of Universe Today. Oh, you know what? I think that's someone's got it, got it going right now. Phil, do you have headphones? It's Nancy. There. <laughs> Whoever did that, <laughs> that was the right thing to do. And now needs to chase down that audio. Was that you, Nancy? No? Great start. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi everyone. My name is Fraser Kane, and I am the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for May 17th, 2012. This week, we're going to be talking about uh, audacious plans to build a real enterprise, the upcoming annular solar eclipse, more evidence that the Earth may or may not be uh, a sentient living creature called Gaia, uh, and uh, fuel for black holes, and then whatever it is that Amy wants to talk about, because she just joined us and she didn't tell us in advance. So, um, sorry, so that'll will... that'll be Hubble and the transit of Venus. Perfect. Amy's going to talk about Hubble and the transit of Venus. So, on deck we've got um, all of our space friends. <clears throat> so we've got uh, Amy Shira Title from Vintage Space. We've got Jason Major from uh, Lights in the Dark and some Universe Today. Uh, we've got Nancy Atkinson, of course, uh, senior editor at Universe Today. We've got the newly doctored uh, Nicole Gallucci, <laughs> and now from CosmoQuest. And uh, I think we should kind of announce that as well, which is that Nicole has, uh, has, has moved, you've moved to Edwardsville? And I moved to Edwardsville last weekend, and I'm in New Mexico now for a conference. For a conference. That's what, Pam, that's what Pamela does. Life with she, Pamela Gay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so, but Nicole is now full-time uh, helping out with uh, CosmoQuest, so mm -hmm. that is really exciting. Um, and I know the weight of the world is on her shoulders now. And of course, uh, last but not least, Dr. Phil Plate, the bad astronomer. Hey, hey. Uh, so, well, let's start with, I think, was the, the big story this week, um, for us at Universe Today, anyway, which was this crazy story about, you know, not crazy, no, a, a forward-thinking and ambitious plan to build a real version of the, of the enterprise. Uh, so, Nancy, I know you report on this, and had, this has now become your career uh, after the, the sort of follow-on, so why don't you give us some information about, about this one? Well, this was kind of a, a great convergence of science fiction and specifically Star Trek mania and uh, humanity's rather deep love of space travel, I guess. Uh, an engineer, a software engineer, came up with a plan and he created this really detailed website outlining his plan to build a, a replica of the, uh, the first, the Constellation class Enterprise from uh, the original series of Star Trek. And uh, he, he had everything down to the smallest level of detail. It's a, a ship powered by three ion propulsion engines, and it's got an onboard nuclear reactor for, for electricity for all the needs, and it's got a, uh, uh, a rotating disk. The saucer section is actually rotating, which so it uh, allows for uh, 1G gravity, so uh, everybody can be comfortable on board. You know, it's not the... Uh, antimatter powered enterprise that we know from the from the series but it's, it would look very similar to the ship commanded by James T. Kirk in the original series. Uh, so it's uh, it was, it's really an audacious idea and uh, and I actually did hear from the engineer himself. I, I had, uh, Fraser had uh, actually uh, pointed this story out to me or this website out to me um, middle of last week and I tried to make contact with the uh, the person behind it and he um, didn't reply, but I guess uh, he, he's been so busy trying to keep his website up now after it's been barraged with uh, all the people from around the world. So anyway, um, like I said, he's got everything down to the most minute detail of funding and where everything would go. And of course, uh, he's, he's, his plan is that we could do this in 20 years with current technology. So it would not be a warp ship. You know, it, we'd be using ion engines. So. Uh, 
he's you know he's really got a long-term plan as well because he's not only proposing building one huge ship but making it the first of a series with three new ships per century uh, you know adding on key advances at, uh, in technology as, as we go along so and uh, the ship it could be several things at once it could be a, a space station at first and then make little short jaunts to uh, the moon and that kind of thing and and one mission that he's pretty fond of is going to Jupiter and going to uh, the moon Europa and using a laser that's on board to cut through the ice and then send a, a ship down below the ice so uh, the whole thing would cost about a trillion dollars uh, it would take 20 years to build it and uh, about two to three hundred launches to build the thing in space um, you know, comparatively, we it took about 50 launches to build the the International Space Station for the construction portion, and that cost about 150 billion dollars. So, uh, uh, you know, the ship is about a thousand meters long. Uh, the Enterprise, uh, the uh, International Space Station is what uh, about 100 meters. So, I mean, it's a big, uh, it's a audacious plan, and with our current funding situation. I don't think it's going anywhere, but it's certainly captured the attention of people around the world. I think the, the response was really interesting from people because you got this weird ambivalence. On the one hand, people would, be, would, would almost sound like you know, cost-cutting bureaucrats, and they'd be like, well, that's just too much money, and that's stupid, and that's real. You know, why would you want that? You know, that design doesn't work. And then on the flip side, you'd be like, that is awesome. That is so cool. And, and I think... He really touched a nerve, or he really did it right in the way he presented his plans because, because they're so detailed and the, the things that he's describing are so reasonable, and yet it's wrapped in this sort of unreasonable shell of making it look like a spaceship from a television show that, right. that I think, it, you know, it's almost like your brain can't handle what it's seeing and thinking about this idea. I, I, found, I found the response quite funny, and you see yeah. it everywhere. It's the same response everywhere. It's like, this is crazy. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah, and and for us, I think it was a lot, uh, very similar to when we had the story years ago about the one-way trip to Mars, or yeah, one-way trip to Mars, and uh, because we're getting the same type of responses where people are saying, "I'll do this, I want to do this," and and some people are saying that's crazy, you're nuts, but yeah, like you said, Fraser, it, it's uh, definitely hit on a a very kind of human emotion or something. And I think the heart of it, right, is is that the the plan, like as a as a design of a spaceship, it's probably not the best design, like for a shape right. and for the number of people who will be on board for for the sort of mission profile. I don't know. Does anyone else have an opinion on this? Oh yeah. <laughs> Actually, Nancy, I think your point about it being like the one way trip to Mars is really good um, because I, I I like the idea of somebody. Thinking, you know, around a problem and saying, what if we, what if we just look at this? You know, a one-way trip to Mars is an interesting idea. And then people are saying, I'll sign up. And I'm thinking, yeah, you're going to sign up. And then they're going to strap you into a rocket. And then what are you going to do? You're going to freak out, right? I, I think people who were enthusiastic about the one-way trip to Mars uh, were enthusiastic about it in sort of a, a non-realistic sense. I like the idea of thinking about it. You don't know where that thinking might take you. It might take you into a direction where uh, going there and coming back wouldn't take you. You might think of technologies you would need for a one-way trip that you wouldn't need for a, a round trip. So I like that idea. Realistically, actually doing it, I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. And I feel the same thing about this. This is a clever idea. Uh, building a ship, doing all these things. Realistically, I mean, I, I read his stuff. No, it's not going to happen. A trillion dollars? I mean, Fraser, I mean, that, that's right away non-starter, right? The, the space station cost $100 billion and almost didn't get built. We had countries dropping out. We had all kinds of international problems. So you can look at that part of it. In the engineering part of it, uh, the stuff he's talking about, this, this rotating ring and everything, we have no idea how to build that. It's, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, scaling up something like that. There's a lot of moving parts. How these things behave in space after a month or two is unknown. So, so that kind of idea, this is all possible. I love the idea of a rotating ring, you know, that old Von Braun space station from 2001. That's fantastic. Um, but building this in 20 years? Come on. So, again, I like this idea, putting this stuff together, thinking outside the box. I hate that phrase, but there you go. Uh, that's all cool. But as, as a realistic, complete package, I'm not buying it. 
<laughs> Anyone else? But this is, but this is, um, I mean, it's the right that's kind of blanket. thinking. Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, it's the, it's the right kind of thinking, and I think that's that's always um, that's always really good to see happening. Um, you know, I mean, it's getting, I, I, yeah, you're right. Thinking out of the box, ter- you know, terrible, terrible uh, 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 turn of phrase, but. That's, this is what people have to be doing. They have to be taking their imaginations and what's more familiar to people than, than Star Trek and Star Wars and things, things like that. Things, that, things that everybody knows about and, and this guy's saying, yeah, well, you know what? This is, this is a, an imagination, uh, imaginary future. Why can't we make it our real, real future? And that's, that's really cool. So I think I think that's that's really the key part of this here. Whether or not whether or not this thing actually launches or gets built is is probably something else entirely. Yeah, and I think the what he what he, the nerve he really touched on, and it's something that we see ta- again and again, is is the demand and interest in better human spaceflight, a better human spaceflight program. That you know that what the government and NASA and things like that, the path that we're on. Uh, doesn't match, I think, what people would be willing to fund and willing to participate in, that there's, there's some kind of disconnect and that there needs to be some other kind of funding model, some other way that these kinds of, of ideas get done, be it through SpaceX, through, through the commercial spaceflight, or maybe it's going to be something through Kickstarter where, where some you know, ragtag group of people say, well, we're going to build a spaceship and it's going to cost $100 million and they're going to raise it with Kickstarter and they're going to do it. So I think that... That that I, that there is this demand, there's this pent up demand out there for for the exploration of space to continue in a more ambitious way, and I think that that that's what what he was doing, and that's what I think other people coming on right now can touch on that same sort of catch that same lightning in the bottle. So um, that's what I that's a, that's the big lesson that I'm taking from this is is uh, we need to launch a spaceship. So well, um, let me throw an addendum there just really quickly. Um, I, like, I, like I said, I like this guy's thinking and everything. I don't think it's realistic. Planetary resources, on the other hand, are talking about something that is essentially very ambitious, going to asteroids and mining them. And they have actually laid out their plan step by step with the funding. They've got their backers. They've got the billionaires who are actually funding them. They're going to do it. And I think that can work. So I don't want to come across as, as this gigantic wet blanket on this. I like this idea, but I think that if you want to be realistic about it, there are ways of being realistic about it and exciting the imagination as opposed to just throwing everything out there and seeing what sticks. Yeah, yeah. All right, why don't we, why don't we move on? Uh, so, Phil, you uh, we're going to oh, announce the that. upcoming uh, annular solar eclipse, which is going to be on the 20th. Yeah, let me get my web page up here because I want to make sure I get the numbers right. Um, Uh, Yeah, there's going to be an annular eclipse. It's Sunday, uh, it's sort of evening in universal time. The timing is uh, 2056 universal time. That's when it starts. That's at uh, very roughly 5 o'clock in the afternoon on the East Coast. This is favoring the West Coast of the United States. The farther west you are, the better. Um, I live in Boulder, Colorado. The sun is going to set while it's eclipsed. Uh, If you're in Japan, that's, that's good. Um, but it, looking at the map here, I put a map up on my website, Albuquerque, Gallup, Reno, and Redding, California, these are sort of your bigger towns uh, that are right in the center of the eclipse path, and that's good. What's going to happen here, I have, of course, models. <laughs> Here's the sun. All right, let me, put my, let me get my screen up here so I can see what I'm doing. Here's the sun. Here's the moon. Right, Ping pong ball, tether ball, not to scale. But let's see if I can do this right. Oh, I have to hold the volleyball way back. Oh, my gosh. Right? In the sky, the moon and the sun are about the same size. Let's see here. There we go. Something like this. Boy, you this love is, your arms, Phil. This is super hard to do. <laughs> here we go. Because I'm also looking at the screen backwards, and there's a delay. Um, so <laughs> when the moon passes in front of the sun, you get an eclipse. And they're about the same size. So a lot of the time, <laughs> and i got to get my head out of the way. This is awesomely, this must be great TV, right? So a lot of the time, when the moon and the sun are the same time, shut up, Nicole. Oh, now you have a PhD. Now you can make fun of me. Okay. So the moon and the sun are the same size in the sky, so the moon completely blocks the sun. But the moon orbits the Earth in an ellipse, so sometimes it's smaller and sometimes it's bigger. Now, we just had a full moon when the, when the moon was uh, closest to the Earth, and that was called a supermoon, um, and you can find my opinions on that online. However, two weeks later, the moon is at the other side of its orbit, 
and it's farthest away from the Earth, and that so happens that it's happening when it's going to line up with the Sun. So the Moon is actually a little bit smaller than the Sun. Uh, tilt my head, move the Moon, and you can see uh, just a little bit of the Sun around the Moon there. Not the best. Not the best way to do Phil, it. Phil is playing the role of Venus um, on yeah, June right. 5th. <laughs> my giant, hot, carbon dioxide, sulfur, <laughs> sulfuric acid raining head. Um, the point here is that the moon is going to be smaller than it usually looks, so it's not going to completely block the sun. There's going to be a ring of sun around the moon. This is called an annular eclipse. Annulus means ring. It's also called a ring of fire, which I, I like, actually. That's cool, because there's this ring of light around the moon. And if you're in a very narrow path across the United States and, and just south of the Aleutian Islands and over in Japan, you will see this effect. If you're outside of this path, you'll just get a, a regular old partial eclipse. That's what I'm going to see here in Boulder. I'm actually pretty excited, because the sun sets over the mountains where I am. So the sun is going to set in eclipse. And I think we're going to get some gorgeous photography of that. Um, you can go online. There are a ton of places to find maps. I know uh, Universe Today covered this. I literally just posted about this a few minutes ago. If you look up May 20th eclipse, uh, you'll find a ton of information to see if it's visible from where you are and what you'll see. Yeah, I'm, I live on Vancouver Island, so I'm going to be north of the path, but, but from what I can tell, I'm going to see about an 80% eclipse. So pretty much, if you're on the western side of Canada and the United States, it's worth attempting to see this. That, that for big chunks of, of the continent, it's going to get dark and, and weird for a little while while the eclipse is happening. Because I, I remember one happening back in like the 1980s, and even though it was only a partial eclipse and less of a partial eclipse than, than what I'll be getting this time around, it's still going to be pretty... It's still going to be pretty dark. It was dark then, and it's going to be even darker this time. So I think it's a pretty weird effect. I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I considered throwing the kids in the car and heading south to try and get to Reading, but um, I think I, if it was a total eclipse, I would make that trip. But if an annular eclipse, I don't know if I'd make that trip. So We kind of have the same uh, dilemma since we're just north of Albuquerque for the conference. The idea was to stay a couple days, um, but I, I think uh, my collaborators haven't seen home in a while and want to see home, and I haven't unpacked. So <laughs> we, we are going to miss it. Yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, if, I mean, if, but if you're anywhere on the West Coast, try to just see it. And there's, again, there's, there's great ways that you can see it. Look up, uh, uh, you can do projections, you can use binoculars. Don't look at the sun with the binoculars, you will burn your eyes. But there's lots of ways. So safe, yeah. you know, Google for safe eclipse viewing and you should get lots of suggestions on, on how to see it. I'm glad you added that, Fraser, because you know what? I didn't put that in my blog post, so I'll add that. But yeah, don't... Don't just slap on sunglasses. Nicole is, is, is showing the latest fashionable eclipse glasses. Yes, I just got these at the conference from some NASA people for the trans of Venus to actually, yeah, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Yeah, these are great because these block the right amount of light. They block mm -hmm. ultraviolet. Um, you don't want to use sunglasses because what happens then is that uh, it makes everything dark, but then your pupils dilate, and that lets in more of the dangerous light if your sunglasses aren't rated correctly for the ultraviolet light. So don't, you know, don't just slap on glasses. Get, pr get the right protective glasses. Like these I cannot see through at all until, unless you're actually looking at the sun. And you um, can order like five packs sun. of those from Amazon.com for like five bucks. They're not expensive. And I think it's probably too late, though. <clears throat> it probably is for the, for the eclipse, but, but you'll still want them for the transit. So the transit yeah, is on, on June 6th of, of Venus, so, which is going to be even a more rare and momentous event. So get, your, get yourself a pair of eclipse glasses. Just have them on hand. Because, I mean, there, there are partial solar eclipses and interesting things to see on the sun all the time. I mean, there's, there's huge sunspots on the sun right now that I think you'd be able to resolve if you had a, you know, a good pair of eclipse glasses on. So That, that big I'll sunspot try. region is right on the western limb of the sun, though. It's, um, it's about to... Oh, well, it was there just a couple of days ago. It's about to I'm rotate sure around on the far yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. All right, why don't we move on? So I, I've, I've got a question for Phil <coughs> uh, oh. regarding, regarding the eclipse. Is, will this be useful for, um, for any scientific uh, observation, or is it basically just, you know, hey, everybody, look? I think this is just cool. Um, an no, annual eclipse. That. I mean, total solar eclipses are good because you can see the corona. You can see the, the, the sort of very wispy outer atmosphere of the sun, but we can see that from space all the time now. Um, there, are effect, there are some eclipse effects. Uh, there's temperature changes and different things like that that can be measured during a total eclipse. 
But with this one, that I have a feeling with only at most 94% of the sun being blocked, I don't think those effects are going to be as strong. Um, but I, I, again, you know, Google it. So if, if anybody's curious, I don't think so, but I might be wrong. So you know, check it out. So I want to move on to Jason. Jason, you've got a story about uh, about Gaia, the Gaia theory that the Earth is one great big connected super -org organism and is completely sentient and uh, and knows and knows what what you're saying right now. And knows what I'm saying right now. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, and is, is it was like in in uh, in Avatar, right? When the uh, when the planet allied the, uh, yeah, the alien just, creatures you know, to you just plug the your planet. you plug your hair into the tree and then the tree knows and can tell you what to do um, so no, is I that mean, what's been discovered uh, y yes no not at all um, there's no no magic trees um, you know I, I had never heard of this uh, well I shouldn't say never heard of it I, I'd come across it a few times but I never really paid it much attention but I um I guess it's been around, now, now the hypothesis has been around since the 70s, and uh, I think it was proposed by uh, uh, James Lovelock and uh, Lynn, Lynn Margulies. And what the idea is, is that Earth isn't just a, a stage, uh, a, 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 you know, a planet that just happens to be in the right spot from the sun, um, you know, it, it, that, that, so, that Earth can, so that Earth can support life. It's not just a stage. Actually, life is building the stage. It's, cre it's actively creating the environment um, for itself. And in doing so, the entire planet is kind of like, you know, kind of like a big cell, I guess. That it's, it's a strange, I mean, it's a strange hypothesis because it, it can get kind of, it can get kind of hippie. I mean, <laughs> you know, because the, the idea of it is, is it gets, it sounds kind of mystical. They gave it a, um, they gave it a name that reflects back to uh, Greek mythology, but there's actually a lot of science involved in there, a lot of science, a lot of chemistry, a lot of biology um, that supports tenets of the, uh, tenets of the hypothesis. Now I say hypothesis, I say theory. It's kind of I, I see I've seen both of it. I've seen uh, the Gaia hypothesis, the Gaia theory. Um, they both reflect the same idea. Earth is a single living organism. Um, sentient, I'm not quite sure where to where to put that uh, where to put that uh, descriptive. But the idea that the whole thing, everything's connected, um, and Earth makes its own environment for life. Well, one of the ideas behind this is that marine organisms can create, um, they can create compounds, they, they would emit uh, sulfur compounds. Sulfur is uh, the, the ninth or tenth most uh, common element in the universe, it's very important to life, uh, it's, it's also very important for climate regulation. Well, researchers at the University of Maryland have found a way to identify some of these compounds, uh, sulfuric compounds, that are emitted by plankton, by phytoplankton, by algae, and can, can make it through the marine environment and actually get out into the atmosphere and then, and then make it to the land and, of course, creating a whole sulfur cycle, getting back into the ocean where they metabolize it and all that. So their research may or may not uh, support or refute the idea that the planet is, you know, has this whole self-regulating system. Whether or not it says that Earth is a sentient being and knows what's going on and you, know, you can plug your hair into it uh, when, when you're going to pass away is something else entirely. But the, the idea is really intriguing that they're able to track these sulfuric compounds from the, from the ocean to the atmosphere, to the land, and, uh, and, and basically see if they're the same thing. They can, they can kind of track them all the way back. So, um, it's just it's just identifying another natural cycle wherein life can create a self-supporting habitat for itself. So it, it it lends itself back to the Gaia hypothesis or the Gaia theory, you know, uh, however you want to see it. Um, but that that's that was the news that came out this week from the University of Maryland. So is it kind of like that the that the Earth is routing these sulfur chemicals where they need to go on the planet? It's it's kind of it's kind of that it's the whole process of, of life actively creating its own stage, its own environment. Um, it's not just that our planet happens to be in the right place for life. It's that life is cr is creating itself. It's it's making it's it's maintaining its own climate in, uh, and not just the things that it needs to metabolize, but it's establishing a climate that it needs. 
um, because what they can do is start to see how the climate changes in response to what's being put out by these uh, marine organisms. So, you know, it's, it's just another part of the whole interconnectedness of things. Now, again, does it mean that Earth is one huge living organism? I don't know. Does it mean that it isn't? That I don't know either. But it's just going to be one more, um, one more way to track whether or not these things are all connected. And, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, in the very least, they'll be able to find, uh, they'll be able to track a very important compound, these sulfuric compounds, through the climate uh, and find out, you know, how they're related to very important pieces of the, um, of the environment, which is marine, marine organisms, these, these uh, uh, phytoplankton. I mean, they're, they're doing a lot of stuff as far as uh, regulating the atmosphere. Right. right, but I can see that it's almost as if there is a balance point and the, the life on Earth possibly is, is working together to bring the climate or bring the sort of various parts, the temperature, the atmospheric mm -hmm. consistency, the amount of usable sulfur, etc., back into this happy place that then Basically, yeah. maximizes the amount of life that can happen on Earth. Exactly, where it, yeah. where it's self-regulating. Um, yeah. You know, if it's if it's too thermostat. too hot in your house, you know, you can you can turn you know you can turn down the thermostat, and that's and that's the whole idea that that you know, Earth can support itself. Earth can support its own life. Um, you know, does that mean it's an organism? Well, you know, well it doesn't reproduce, or or are we part of the whole process and if we colonize other worlds is that earth reproducing so there's a lot of questions involved with the uh, with yeah. the whole hypothesis but it's an interesting it's an interesting concept anyway all right well last but not least we're going to talk to Amy about uh, the plans to use Hubble to stare at the Sun by the moon yeah <clears throat> so so like us Hubble can't look directly at the Sun or else it'll fry its, uh, its you know would-be eyes so the transit of Venus is coming up on June the 5th or 6th, depending on uh, where you are in the world. So what that means, and I'm not going to try to do props or anything, uh, Venus is much smaller than the moon in our sky, and it's going to cross in front of the disk of the sun, and we can see it as a tiny little black dot moving its way across. Um, so Hubble has an awesome vantage point. I would love to see this from space, but it can't look at the sun, so it's going to watch the light of the transit coming, bouncing back off the moon which I think is a really cool way to do it. So, so the light from the sun is going to be passing through the atmosphere of Venus, and Hubble is going to use um, to measure the atmosphere coming back off the moon to determine what its atmosphere is made of. So we know what the atmosphere of Venus is, but what they're using this data from Hubble to do is calibrate how it's going to um, analyze the light coming in from exoplanets which is kind of a really, really cool application of this really rare scientific event. Um, yeah, so if, if Hubble can accurately determine what the atmosphere of Venus is based on this method of bouncing the light back off the moon, then it can do the same thing and reasonably take really good measurements of what exoplanets are made of in terms of atmosphere. So that's going to happen. And so this is more, uh, like, as you said, this isn't... Like they're because they know what the atmosphere of Venus is. It's not like they're trying to figure it out, or they're they're not going to. The point is, this is a calibration. This, this is, is a calibration. A, so let's see if we can figure out what the atmosphere of a exoplanet is made of, just purely through the changes in the light that comes from it. Yeah, and and um, I think what they're trying to do is see if if bouncing it off the moon is a way to do it. If Hubble can't look at another star. Um, if it can do the same thing, if it can look at the light that's bouncing off the moon to try to determine what the atmosphere is. So that would be a really neat way to look for exoplanets, of reflections of the planet from its own light. Well, and we've mentioned this in, in, the, in the Hangout and, and definitely in, in Astronomy House, we talk about this a lot, that, that if you can look at the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet, that tells you a lot. And in fact, if you know the atmosphere of the planet uh, and you can see like free oxygen in the atmosphere, then that's almost a perfect indication that there's going to be life on that planet. There's lots of chemicals that just can't exist naturally in nature. They have to have some kind of process that's going on that's actually generating it. And so, in fact, being able to detect the atmospheres of these distant planets is 
the holy grail of, yeah, it's, of it's planetary a huge step in the search, yeah. finding another Earth and the whole you know, search for life and following water. Because if you can see water vapor, then there's water. And then, you know, it's worth more study. And maybe we'll take that giant Starship Enterprise over there and check it out. I don't know. Fire up those ion drive <laughs> engines. We'll yeah. get there and you know, uh, let's see. Warp how on over and like see a million what happens. years, yeah. <laughs> cool. I said last but not least, but what I meant was, last but not least, we've got Nicole talking about uh, fuel for black holes. So, Nicole, what was this, what was this story? And it's, it's in your field, right? It's all radio. Uh, no, it's not radio. It's, it's not optical, radio. but it is an oh, okay. interferometer. Mm. So the way you measure, you know, one way to measure tiny, 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 tiny things on the sky uh, is that you need a larger and larger telescope. But in some cases, you uh, combine the power of multiple telescopes together into something called an interferometer. Um, so they did this with a very large telescope interferometer in Chile and looked at um, a supermassive black hole, the center of a galaxy. I think it's NGC something, something, 3783, there we go, 3783, um, to try and see what the environment is like around this black hole. So the current hypothesis for, uh, so all right, back up a little bit, um, th these, these things are called active galaxies or active galactic nuclei or AGN. So it's basically when matter is falling onto the black hole and it's making it really bright and do all kinds of crazy stuff. Now, there are different kinds of AGN. Um, that have been discovered over the decades. Some of them give off radio waves. Some of them you can see in x-ray. Some of them have a certain type of absorption line. Some look different. Um, there's this whole zoo of, of AGN, of, of, active, of active galaxies. Um, and in the early 90s, there was this um, popular hypothesis that is um, still well known today called the unifica AGN unification theory, which basically says, that all of these things look the same, uh, or are the same object, but seen from different angles. So uh, this morning, when I was in the morning session, they give us clay and said, you know, do whatever you want with it. When this isn't part of the conference. OK, so I tried to make a uh, model of, of <laughs> an active galaxy while sitting in the morning session. Um, what you have, so I have this, this donut-like thing here. I don't know how well you can see. It's awesome. It looks um, fantastic. So in the center, what you can't, what I couldn't figure out a good way to model was you have a tiny, you have the supermassive black hole, uh, and it's got a disk of material around it that's giving off lots of light. Um, and if you're looking straight at it, so we have pipe cleaners too, um, you can see this light. Eh, I have the same problem as Phil. With Not that. easy, is it? Yeah. No. <laughs> I, <laughs> so you can either see the light beaming right down at you, you can see it from the side, and sometimes see these radio jets. Um, and uh, around the black hole, so there's this, there's kind of this dusty ring here, and then there's this big, fat, dusty torus. Um, so what they did is they looked at the infrared light looking at this ring, so the dust is actually giving off infrared light, and they were able to measure the size of this, um, of this, of this part of the AGN. Um, and they said, and uh, using the interferometer, and so it, it came out to um, 0.16 parsecs, which is you know teeny tiny on on galactic scales, um, but you know 10 to the 12 miles um, in, in in more human units. So they're basically testing this, and they said, yes, we can you know see features of the torus, and we can see the ring, and we can see all the stuff. Um, what they're looking at next is the actual accretion mechanism, so how the matter falls from this area here onto the black hole, and that's what they're hoping to do next with the with the, um, that interferometer. So yeah, why black do you get that thing. difference? Like, why do you get that those two shapes? You've got the bigger torus, and then you've got right. that that disc. What 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 distinguishes between the two? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure how to answer. Sorry, I just that, Bill, that's you. A, I know. <laughs> Bill knows. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> I know vaguely. It has to do with tides from the black hole. Um, as matter gets close to the black hole. Oh, Yikes! Okay, sorry about that. The microphone. As as material gets closer to the black hole, it's it's squeezed vertically, and you get a flat disk. Farther out, uh, it kind of flares. Yeah. yeah. All of this material is super hot. So as it gets farther out, and the gravity, the gravitational squeezing is less, the gas will expand, and so it it, it puffs up. Uh, you see this a lot in various uh, different things, um, but it, it's it's most severe around a black hole. But why, I, I, what I don't understand is why there's so much dust in it. Because that seems to be the thing that makes it so that it's blocked when you're looking at it edge on. 
and not blocked when you're looking at it face on, and that, that's what I'm not sure of. Uh, is, it, is the dust heavier and it gets chucked out? It might be. Hmm. I mean, it's it's coming from it's coming from material outside the black hole. So there's star right. formation. When stars are born, they make dust. When they die, they make dust. As they oh, right. age, they make dust. Dust, dust, dust. <laughs> so and there's a lot of and there's a lot of star formation. Star formation and AGN activity seem to be somewhat correlated, and so that dust is left over from earlier bouts of of. Yeah, there's a, there's a there are a lot of ideas that when galaxies collide, uh, they they make lots of stars, and it also disrupts the gravity of the galaxy so that stuff can fall into the center and feed the black hole and make the galaxy active. There are problems with this because there's not that, that you would expect, oh, every time that happens, every time two galaxies collide, you would see this and you don't. So right. there's lots of specific examples that, that, that count, uh, there are counter examples of this, but we kind of sort of think that's what's going on. Right. And this, this thing is so far away that it's hard to distinguish. Um, it's, you know, I'm going to do a fill. It's so far away, yeah. it's hard to distinguish what's the black hole, what's the star formation around it. And that's why you bring in an interferometer so that you can get really high spatial resolution uh, to see what's going on in the system. But it's a tough technique. Why didn't look at closer galaxies? I mean, Centaurus um, A is well, really we, close. There's only so many. This is a... Seifert 1.5, so maybe they need it to be at a certain angle. Oh, okay, that's true. Centaurus A is more edge on. I just Gary wrote about this like yesterday. This. There are other nearby galaxies that are at different angles. Mm -hmm. um, so this is pretty powerful method. I can't wait to see what else they're going to do with it. Now, now Nancy had to leave us. She has a uh, <clears throat> a telecon that she has to call into for uh, Hi, space exploration. So she's already gone. I don't know if anyone else needs to jump into that. If anyone has no idea what I'm talking about, that's fine. Uh, so anyway, there's, we've got a few questions, so why don't we quickly get through those, and uh, we'll free everybody. So if anyone has any questions about any of the uh, stories that we talked about today or at any point, uh, or any ideas at all ever, uh, just post them into the comments uh, where you're watching this Hangout, and I will, uh, I will scoop them up. So, so a couple of questions here. Um, uh, so John... McKinney wants to know, he said he's, he's surprised that the moon would not be too bright for Hubble. So I guess this is this observation of, of Venus. Is it, I mean, the, the moon does, does uh, reflect a lot of the light from the sun. It's, you know, it's still pretty bright in the sky, but that's not too much for Hubble? Um, it's not, actually. In, in everything, all my researching for the, the articles that I wrote on this, didn't say that it was too bright. And it might have to do with the area of the moon that they've chosen to focus on. Um, it's the, the Tycho Crater, which I was going to pull a picture up of and share, but I didn't have time because it's a little late. Um, so it, it might have to do with that being a little bit of a grayer and more varied surface. Um, and I, I don't know if, if maybe Phil can speak to how Hubble actually works a little bit, but it might be, I mean, the exposure of this, of the transit is actually seven hours. So they might be doing it at such a sort of taking in light and such small bouts that it's not going to kind of fry its eyes the way looking at the sun would. Um, that's our... Uh-oh. we lose her? Did we lose Actually, her? That's the one thing I'm not totally sure. Oh, hi? <laughs> yeah, you're okay. You're yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so, no, how, um, the, the moonlight isn't going to damage it, but it, I'm not completely sure why now that you bring it up. Go ahead. I, bring it up. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay, Phil. You worked okay, on that I'll camera. You um, invented that camera, right? What's that? You invented the camera yes, on the yes, I, knew, I knew you worked on that. Um, I, I think they are using the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph for this, which is a camera I helped build. I didn't invent it. Um, but in <laughs> fact, um, Hubble, there's, there's a series of things you can talk about here. One is that there are different instruments on Hubble. Hubble's, you think of Hubble as like a, a telephoto lens that you can strap different camera bodies onto. And there are different cameras on board, some of them are more sensitive than others, uh, but they can take extremely short exposures. So it turns out that uh, Hubble not only can observe the moon, it has several times. Um, I, bet I was on a couple of projects where we observed the moon with, with this camera. Uh, the problem isn't the exposure time, because you can take very short exposures and not overexpose the camera. The problem is the moon is moving really quickly, and Hubble can see such fine detail that you know, you're, you're trying to basically take it's like a picture of a race car zooming by. If you don't take a really super short exposure and aim the telescope exactly right, you're going to miss it. So what they do is they kind of point the telescope where the moon's going to be, wait for the moon to move in, and then take the shot. Um, 
so, so they can take pictures of the moon. In fact, Hubble routinely observes the Earth, which is far brighter than the moon. Uh, they do that for calibration reasons to, uh, to, to make sure that the cameras are behaving properly. Also, uh, what they're doing is they're not taking, as far as I understand it, they're not taking a photograph. They're not taking an image that you'll, you can look at. They're taking a spectrum, which breaks up the light by colors. And when you do that, uh, you can actually determine sort of the chemical elements that you're seeing. So as sunlight passes through Venus's atmosphere, those elements like, well, the carbon dioxide, the molecules of that, and other things will absorb certain colors of light. So they're going to look for that in the lunar observations. But to do that, you're taking that light and you're spreading it out at all these colors. That dims it. It's like taking... Uh, uh, it's, it's like uh, having rain falling into a bunch of different buckets. I'm trying to think of a way to describe this well. But, but each, each, uh, each pixel of the camera is going to see a lot less light than it normally would, and it's actually by a factor of 1,000. So suddenly an object that might be you know, 100 times too bright to observe, say, might be easily observable by doing it this way. But they can observe the moon anyway. So I'm trying to make this as confusing as possible because I'm thinking <laughs> too many things at once. The point is the moon is not too bright. Uh, it's been done before. Um, and uh, this is an extremely difficult observation. Uh, I'll be very curious to see how they do it because they're looking at something that is changing by a tiny, tiny fraction of a percent. And while they're observing, the, the sun is changing its, its angle on the moon. It's illuminating the moon differently. And I, you know, they're going to have to take all those effects into account. It's going to be very complex and, and difficult. And, they're going to be having taking that, multiple shots, right? And I'll and add that Hubble is orbiting the Earth, and the Earth is blocking its view of the Moon periodically as well. So factor that into the difficult shot that Hubble yeah. has to take. So, so they're just gonna, they're going to basically take snapshots, probably thousands of snapshots of the moon while, they're, while the Venus transit's going on to be able to do this. They, 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 we've done it before. We observed um, uh, transit of an exoplanet, uh, the very first, uh, I think it was the very first hot Jupiter that was detected, and we observed it with this camera. And it was hundreds and hundreds of exposures. It was pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, and actually, someone asked a related question on that, which is, um, <clears throat> uh, Bryce Alexander wants to know, I know it's spectral analysis, but I have to wonder how the lunar materials absorbing some of the light will impact the results. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's something that's already a known quantity. So you're comparing without Venus to with Venus, and that difference will probably give you... Of course, the moon is But too, the, moon, right? the moon doesn't... Or from what, from what I, I remember reading about this is that the, since the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it's not absorbing any of the light from the, the spectrum of the sun after it passes through the atmosphere of Venus. So if we, if we know what, how sunlight is affected bouncing off the moon, then right. it can calibrate that out. But it shouldn't, right. the, the difference should be minor, from what I understand. It will be small, yeah. I'm thinking about that. If, if the moon had a thick atmosphere, that would be a problem. But it may absorb certain frequencies of light. But even if it does, yeah, you can, you can compensate for that. That's probably why they chose Tycho. Calibrating off the moon was how they cal looked for spectroscopy of Mars and Venus way back when. So this has been, this has been done for ages. Yeah. This is a, um, this is, now Fraser, I don't know if you can pop that, that, or if that window comes up, but that's a, uh, that's a Hubble picture of Aristarchus uh, that was taken by Hubble. And I don't know exactly what, um, you know, what method they use to get those, uh, the, what the colors relate to, but that's what I just dug up from uh, NASA site. So it gets pretty good detail. I mean, it's, yeah. it's impressive. It relates to awesomeness. Yellow parts are more awesome. Um, so uh, good. Well, I think we've uh, we've kind of run out of time, and I need to. I know I want to let everybody go and uh, attend their various uh, space exploration teleconferences. So uh, so thanks to everybody for for joining us. Now, where can people find more about each one of you, uh, Amy? Where can we learn more about you? Uh, you can find my writing at Discovery News America Space uh, Motherboard and my blog VintageSpace.wordpress.com own domain coming soon. Oh, you don't have your... Oh, that's right. We, we nagged you last time, yeah. didn't we? I'm yeah, just, all I'm right. transferring all my data still. Oh, good. Okay. And Jason? You can find my writing at lightsinthedark.com. Uh, I also am frequently uh, writing for Universe Today. Awesome. And Nicole? Noisyastronomer.com. That links to all the random stuff I do. And um, a lot of stuff is going to be coming on CosmoQuest, right? Yes, CosmoQuest, Discovery Space, uh, Skeptic, 
and uh, also find out how uh, a really cool event happening in St. Louis in a couple weeks you should come to that I'll be at. Cool. Teaser. Teaser. Teaser plug. <laughs> <laughs> and Phil, where can we find your writings? I'm at Discover Magazine. Just look up Bad Astronomy on the web and you'll find me. And I'm Bad Astronomer on Twitter. And of course, uh, Nancy and I'm at, at universetoday.com. Uh, now, for anyone who's actually listening to the audio, because we put the audio into uh, the Astronomy Cast feed, we record the show every week uh, on Thursdays at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 1 Eastern Time. So if you ever want to watch us live and ask your questions, uh, we'd love to have you watching us. It's on Google+, Plus, it's on YouTube, it's on CosmoQuest, so you should have lots of opportunity to be able to watch it. So, uh, th so thanks to everybody who joined us. Thanks to everybody who's watching, and we will see all of you next week. Thanks, Fraser. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Fraser. Bye. Thanks.